Well, good morning, everyone. What a good song to bring us into worship. It's a glorious day here in North Vancouver. Welcome uh, to worship here this morning, whether you will join us on live stream, whether you're in the sanctuary, whether you're young or old or in between, whoever you are, we're delighted that you are with us this morning for worship. As we gather here together, we acknowledge that uh, we do so on the uh, unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples and the traditional lands of the Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. So just a few announcements. Look at your highlights. Uh, they're beginning to fill up again with all of the activities and the work of the church. Um, just to lift up a couple, the Seniors Connection has line dancing this Thursday, so make sure that you've got yourself physically in shape for that. Um, it's Thursday. It's all the information's in your highlights. Uh, I suspect uh, Colleen would like you to sign up for that, so if you could let her know that you'd be present, that would be great. Birthdays. Uh, anybody got a January birthday out there? Aha. Well, you guys are going to have, the two of you, did I see more hands than that? Because that's more than a tuxedo cake each for you. So, uh, if you have a January birthday or one that's close to January and you might not have been here in December to share that, uh, your birthday cake then, or maybe you're going to be away in February, well, join them downstairs in the lower hall or in that fireside room uh, for cake. And uh, yeah, it's tuxedo cake apparently that you're going to have. Uh, Colleen also wants me to remind you, uh, in the highlights is the um, uh, Chinese lunch to celebrate the Lunar New Year. And uh, that's on Sunday, February the 3rd after worship. So please sign up for that. We need to know how many people are coming because we do have to order that. And while you're signing up, you could also maybe put your name down as to helping out with that because we can't do these events without people that help to set up and help to take down and all the things that go along with a, a lunch here at the church. So if you would sign up for that, that would be great. And while you're out there in the action or in the welcoming space at the action table, uh, Simone still has some multi-faith calendar she's trying to sell. So would you please buy it? So I don't have to announce this again. <laughs> um, study group starts on Tuesday in the afternoon and in the evening. It's um, Holy Human, Holy Divine, and uh, Will and Sandy are looking after that. We've got quite a few people signed up for both of those, I believe. But if you'd still like to be a part of that, there's still a chance to sign up for, for those as well. So we'll look at your highlights um, around that. Will has something very exciting to tell us. <clears throat> A uh, year and a half ago, uh, we had the very first Faith Fest, um, and uh, it was a great success here. It was kind of like a staycation for the congregation and a congregational renewal event. Well, Faith Fest 2019 is on the way, so mark your calendars, March 1st to 3rd. It's a weekend to be together to hear some fantastic speakers. The, the plan, is, the theme is Into the Wild. It's a TED Talk style weekend of five speakers each with 20 minutes and then we have a chance to engage with each of them on the theme of just tell us the story of what is the fire of faith that burns in you and where did, where did it come from? And so that'll be March 1st to 3rd. Uh, you can sign up online and if not this week, then next week you'll be able to sign up in the uh, welcome space. Thanks, Will. So, those are our announcements. Let's just take a moment to center ourselves, to take that deep breath and uh, be prepared to come into worship of God. From the midst of our real lives, with our real joys and our real sorrows, we come seeking courage and strength 
from the presence of God and from the support of one another in community. As people who love and loved wholeheartedly, if also imperfectly, we come hoping to come in contact with a love that is elegant and endless, the love of the one who made us. So come, friends, let's, let us open our hearts to the blessing of our Maker, open our hands to one another and to the world, our whole selves to the risk and the joy of life dedicated to God's love in this world. So come, let us worship. Will you join me in prayer? Oh God, what an amazing day you have created. We do praise you. We look out the window to the sky and the mountains and the sea and your handiwork is evident everywhere. Thank you. In this season, we thank you for the gift of Jesus who has given us a window through which to view the world, to view our own lives, to view others. And your love is the framework that surrounds it all. So gather us together today and to try to look at the world through your loving eyes, through your perspective, to see what you see, to love what you love, to bless what you bless as we worship you today. Amen.
by the light. That, that blue window magnifies the light right in my eye. <coughs> wow. Yeah. You know, with all the rain we've had this winter, any little bit of light is like welcome, but this is overwhelming. Yeah. So I went looking for stamp pad this morning. I don't know which ones of these work. You ever get stamped? You ever get, get stamped? Gone to an event, maybe? And when you get in, get to the door, remember what they do? Like you pay your, oh, that's that one. I don't think that one, well, that might show up. Let's try this one. Um, you get to the door and they, and you pay your money and then you go into the lineup and then they go, and you have to decide where on your body the, you're gonna, you're gonna put that. I, I usually put it here and it looks, hey. So why do they do that? Why do they do that, George? So they know that you've paid. So they know that you should be there. And if they look around, yeah, if they look around and they see somebody without a stamp, going, that person's not really supposed to be here. Any other reasons why we do this? Any? Like what happens if you leave? And you, they, yeah, they know you've been and you can come back and you don't have to pay again, right? So, yeah. Um, I, it, it occurred to me, this stuff might not be very good for you. Um, <laughs> What if they were to use water? Just go, whoosh, stamp water. In you go. You got stamped. You know you got stamped. That'd be okay? That would work? No. It could wipe off. Yeah, yeah. Or even if it didn't wipe off, it could evaporate. It could. And then if you left and you came back and you go, I, you stamped me. I remember. You went, it was right there. And they go, Nah, I don't think so. I don't remember. And you could say, but I remember. But that's not good enough. Um, in our Bible story today, we will hear the story of Jesus being baptized. And in his, when he was baptized, he came out of the water and he heard a voice. And the voice said, you are my beloved. In you I am well pleased. Can you imagine if you heard the voice of God saying to you, you are my beloved. In other words, I love you. I'm pleased with you. Can you imagine what that would have been like? And what that would be like? It was like a, he, he, he came out of the water and he, and he had to like a, this stamp of approval. I, I love you and, and I'm pleased with you. And then he went off into his ministry. And there was no ink stamp that said, mm, this is the one that you know, has God's stamp of approval on this one. But he knew it because it had happened to him and he heard it and he felt it. Baptism still happens here, but we do it right here. And we take water and we fill up this thing we call the font. And God bless Joy, she made it warm water. <laughs> Isn't that lovely? <laughs> so that it's not too shocking to the system. Yeah, and, and people come and gather around the font and we say those same words. We use, we use this water and we place this water on them and we remind them of the, the same words that, that Jesus heard. You are God's beloved child. In you, God is well pleased. And then they go off and the water evaporates <laughs> or it gets washed off like I'm doing with this cloth. And we hope that it, it's the kind of blessing that, that kind of stays with them. But it can sometimes be hard to remember that, that, we, that we're walking around 
with that stamp of God's approval on us all the time. We can't see it. It's not on our body. It's not like this stamp. We can't see it, but, but it's there. There are some churches that have a font very much like this, and they put it at the very back aisle, way back there. And when people come into church, and they're coming in, like as if I'm coming into church, and they go to turn down the aisle, and they look, and they go, or they put their finger in the font, and they put it on their forehead, and they come in, and they come to church. Any idea why they do that? Any idea why churches have it at the very back, and people put the water on them? Why do you think? So they can feel more connected to God. Yeah, it's that kind of, it's the tangible thing. It's the thing you can feel more connected to God. And they do that every week. I actually think it's a pretty good idea. We don't, we don't have that in our tradition, but to come every week and put a little water on to remind you that God says, I love you. I'm pleased with you. I can imagine how that would make a huge difference on an every week basis. So, as you head off to Children's Church today, I want to invite you to come by on your way there in to, to the font and put your fingers in the water and put the water on your hands or on your forehead or on your arm or wherever you want to put it, on your cheek, wherever. <laughs> Whatever would remind you that that message is for you too. That God loves you dearly and God is pleased. Sound like a plan? Okay. Well, let's, we're going to sing while that's happening. And please, just come forward, put your fingers in the font, put that water on you some, somewhere, and head off to Children's Church. First scripture reading this morning is from Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 to 4. Most of us, at one time or another, have gone through a time in which we really wondered whether God was with us. For us, for most of us, there are times when we feel alone. The Hebrew people experienced times like this. 
And then one such time is when they were living in exile in Babylon. They felt like God either did not exist or had abandoned them. In today's reading, Isaiah tried to tell them otherwise and reassure them of their prized and precious place in God's heart. But now thus says the Lord, the one who created you, O Jacob, who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. You, for you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. The second reading is from Luke chapter 3, verses 15 to 17, 21, and 22. Every year at the beginning of the season of Epiphany, soon after Christmas, the scriptures we read begin to focus our attention on Jesus' ministry. In each of the four Gospels, his ministry begins with his own baptism by the desert revolutionary John the Baptist. At his baptism, the gospel tells us of God's blessing, well, which rests upon him like a dove. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the throng, song of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the shaft he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now when all the people were baptized and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven op was opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church.
Will you join me in prayer? Gracious God, we thank you that you accompany us through every aspect of our lives. We thank you for that original blessing that bathes our lives even when we don't know it. And so we give you this time and ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts, as with the actions of our lives, be bathed in your blessing. Amen. I don't know whether or not this story ever really happened, but I know it's true. I say that about lots of the Bible stories, too, because sometimes it's hard to figure out what's history and what's, what's story-bound truth. But the late, great Fred Craddock, uh, a, a wonderful uh, preacher and teacher and activist, a guy from the States from whose 20th century, like, if, if any preacher in the Protestant tradition did not run across Fred Craddock's This Is How You Preach books, well, you got to question it. That's how prominent a person he, he was. Well, he used to tell the story uh, of a, a boy who did not have a father. I mean, I know my biology as well as you do. Um, I know that he had a father, but he didn't have anybody, he didn't know who his father was. He didn't have anybody also in his life that he would call dad. And this little guy grew up in a time, middle of the 20th century, and in a place in which people tended to be less than kind to people with histories like his. Not that he made the history of his beginnings, but they would call him ugly names. Some people wouldn't let their children play with him. And, and they would talk about his family in the privacy of their own homes, but the other kids would take those stories and bring them to school, and it got difficult. It got really hurtful. Bullying was commonplace back then, and is still. Uh, the Internet has taken it up a notch, I think, a little bit. Uh, but you get the picture, right? Now, on Sunday, this little guy would come to a church close to his house, just by himself. He would come late and leave early so that nobody would talk to him, but he would come there. But there was this one Sunday when there was this guest preacher, and this man talked about God's love and God's grace with this great, big, dark, brown voice that just went straight into you. And the little boy not only, not only heard the words, but he kind of felt the words. Uh, as if they were, they were meant for him directly. And at the end of the service, the little guy did what he always used to do. He'd flip out just before things were finished. But on this Sunday, this preacher came bounding down the aisle and caught up with him. And uh, he looked down at him with these warm eyes and asked what the little boy's name was. And then the preacher asked the very question that the boy hated more than any other question. He said, so whose boy are you? This, uh, uh, this is the southern states about 60 or 70 years ago. And in the south, uh, I mean, there's some places in the Maritimes that are kind of like this as well. Uh, whose boy are you? What, what family do you come from? Who, who are your relatives? Where, what's your lineage? That, that really mattered. Uh, most important in sort of patriarchal uh, communities is like, who's your father? And this little boy had listened to this preacher talk about the love and grace of God all morning. 
And upon hearing those four words, whose boy are you, any thought that that love and grace included him kind of vanished in the anxiety of the question. Whose boy are you? This preacher stood there and looked down at the little guy waiting for an answer. The little boy stood there looking down at his shoes, hoping that the preacher would just kind of, that question didn't happen or we would just go away and hoping, certainly hoping that he wouldn't get sucked into one of those name-calling situations like he was so used to. It's bad enough to hear it on the playground, but to hear it from this person who spoke of the love and grace of God as if he had a, he was a good friend of God's, you know, that would be too tough. Well, the congregation was singing its final hymn, and, and uh, in that last verse, and they stood there, and finally the, the preacher got down on one knee, and he put his hand on the boy's shoulder, and, and he said, I asked it again, whose boy are you? And then just as the congregation was finishing that last verse, the preacher, he did something that, that my son's piping teacher does, some, used to do sometimes put his hand underneath the boy's chin and kind of lifted it up and as if as if by lifting up the chin you could lift his whole spine to its full stature he lifted it up lifted up the chin looked him in the eye he said oh i know whose boy you are you're god's boy i see the resemblance i see the resemblance Now, I'm not sure how that boy experienced that. How, whether he, he experienced it as just pure relief. Oh, he's not going to do any of those names. Whew, got through that one. Or whether he experienced it as the profound blessing it was intended to be. It's a moment of truth that could last a lifetime. A kind of a sacramental moment. There's, there's a a divine blessing, but there's no water involved, just eye contact and understanding. It's a kind of blessing that doesn't evaporate or get wiped off, but can linger. It's more like a salve than it is like water. That preacher, in that moment, was what Madeleine Langell, the, the author, calls a namer. In her fantasy book, The Wind at the Door, she writes of naming as a vocation. Her main character, Meg, is trying to figure out where she fits into the divine plan, and she, she wants to know what her vocation is. And she speaks to the wise angel character whose name I can never pronounce properly. I think it's Progenoski. Anyhow, this angel tells her about the divine vocation of Namer. When I was memorizing the names of the stars, part of the purpose was to help them each become more particularly the particular star each one was supposed to be. That is basically the job of a namer. Maybe you are supposed to make earthlings feel more human. Well, the preacher at that moment was a namer for that little guy. Every once in a while, we all need someone to be our namer to remind us who we are, who we're meant to be, remind us that we have that soul inside of us that's, that's alive and that is, is helping cast our path. I don't, I don't know what, to what degree Jesus needed to hear the voice he heard at his baptism. I mean, who knows what he was experiencing at that time, especially whether he felt daunted by the words he was hearing 
passed on to him and and offered directly to in in and around him at by John the Baptist all that stuff about about winnowing fork and threshing floor and all that might have been pretty daunting perhaps perhaps he needed a namer according to the gospel he heard a voice naming him God's beloved and whether or not he was looking at the holes in his shoes at the time there is profound affirmation in that blessing it happens at least twice more in his ministry the last of which I think is at the garden of Gethsemane and in that case the voice rises up from within him you are my beloved though the path that he is on may be painful it is blessed It's about being reminded who we are and what we're here for and who we belong to and how it might be that we fit into the grand uh, scheme of God's activity in the world, God's life in the world. How we are particularly called to be the particular person that we are. We're now in the season after Epiphany. So with Christmas gone, New Year's gone, even Epiphany gone, there's these series of weeks over the next between now and and the beginning of March. And our worship life seems to follow the the story of Jesus' ministry from its beginning and as as it expands. And so it begins with some naming, some revealing, First at his baptism, and then in the coming weeks we follow the story as he slowly becomes known as as healer and mystic and teacher and radical prophet, and that that being known spreads. And we we notice how he becomes noticed, and in some cases accept, accepted, and in other cases threatening to those around followed by some. The first step is to figure out who he is and how he fits in to God's life in the world. We can't know with precise historic accuracy what happened at his baptism and how it felt to him or the people around him, but the story makes it sound like it had a profound effect on everything that came afterwards. Being, feeling, and knowing the divine blessing is there. It's the beginning of what I think of as a big reveal of his central role in the unfolding story of a love that, that is radical, that is going to ask a lot of people, but is going to dish out blessing to people in a way they've never experienced it before. I'm sure it's true for you too, but I, I have had times in when I need to hear again and be reminded of who I am and what I'm here for and what, who I belong with and who I belong to and, and what my place in, in the divine scheme of things really is and what it isn't. There are times when, when, when life can kind of diminish that confidence, that assurance in us whether it's through other people's actions, whether it's through our own actions, and we kind of lose touch or lose confidence in that divine blessing within us. Like the boy in Craddock's story, or, or any of us 
in any of our stories. There are hundreds of ways we can lose track and lose our sense of, of ourself, forget. But I need also to be reminded when, when I face choices. Like forks in the road are oftentimes when we need to, to know very clearly in ourselves. Yeah, no, this is, this is who I am. This is who I belong to. And therefore, I will take this step even if it's risky because I know I'm a beloved child of God and, that, and no one can take that away. Nothing can take that away. As Christians, we have chosen to try to bear witness with our lives to a radical love and a compassionate vision of humanity. And that can... Ask a lot of us. Ask a lot of integrity from us. Ask a lot of risk-taking from us. And it's in those times that we need a namer. Someone to remind us that we are not some accident of randomness. We have been created and crafted and blessed and it matters what happens and what we do. That we are particular creations of a loving creator created for a holy purpose. So, as you head out <laughs> into this season and into whatever your life uh, consists of, Hear the message, and it will not be visible like a stamp, or, but it's like water. It's, it's there, but, but it can sink in, and so let it sink in. Let it sink in like a thaw. Let it be a reminder of the particular human you are blessed to be. Imagine the Holy One getting down on one knee and taking you by the chin and lifting you up as you feel that lifting up straighten you for the integrity to which you are called and hearing the words when you pass through the waters I will be with you and the rivers they will not overwhelm you when you walk through fire you shall not be burned and the flames will not consume you for I am the Lord your God. You are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. You are my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. Amen. I know this happens, and I know this is true. You, we, are a generous people loved by a generous God. And when we see a need in our neighborhood, in our community, in the world beyond, we respond to that. We respond to that modeled by the love that God has for us. We show love for the world. And so we make an offering. We make an offering to this community, to this church. We do so when the plate comes by and we put an envelope in or we know that in our hearts um, we give by par, which is a pre-authorized withdrawal from our bank accounts. We do that on a monthly basis. Or we put whatever's in our pocket into that plate. We make that offering 
so that this place can continue to be what it is for this community and for the world. So now your offering will be received. Please join me as we say together our prayer of dedication. Loving God, when Jesus was baptized, the Spirit came upon him as a dove, 
as the touch of peace, as divine blessing, as we make this offering and as we live this week. Let your peace and your blessing continue through what we give, what we do, and who we are in the world. in prayer. Gracious God, as we settle into this new year, we offer prayers of thankfulness that we have this place called Highlands to be our home. We feel blessed to be surrounded by many generations, by babies and toddlers and children whose giggles and cries and laughter and inquisitiveness bring such joy to our hearts by young people who find friendship and a place to explore their faith, and who use their faith and their remarkable talents to make the world around them a better place. And by young adults, by adults young and, and young at heart, hopeful believers who bring the wisdom of their years and the resources of their lives, offering themselves as faithful servants of you, O God. And God, you take us to the river you baptize us in your love and you set us on a path to wholeness and life. You have called us to be the church, your church in this time and in this place. We pray that our hearts and minds might be open to the truth of how we should live and how we should be in this world. We pray that the actions of our lives are a profession of our faith. We pray that we are faithful to your call to us to be a community that is open and inclusive and welcoming, to be a church that is filled with light and hope and compassion, to be a people who care for each other and care for all creation. You, gracious God, are in the midst of all that we do. You are the one who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. God, we pray for this world and all your glorious creation. We pray for those who struggle in poverty, with homelessness and hunger. We try to respond with generosity and care. We pray for victims of violence and war, of ethnic and religious hatred. And we remember that your will is for all people to be accepted and respected, and that walls of separation should be torn down and not built up. You ask us to seek justice and resist evil and to honor our differences and celebrate our similarities as people of God. We pray that we will do that in all the places where we live and work and play. Now, Holy One, in a moment of silence, we offer prayers for all the circumstances and all the people that weigh heavily on our hearts. And we do that now. Our morning prayer list is filled with names and concerns of this congregation. And so we pray for those now. We pray for Bud and Maud, for Barb, for Bernice and Al, for Michael and Ed and Agnes, for Rick and Patty and Phyllis, for Bud and Carolyn, for Samantha and Matt and Abby, for Jeanette and Jeannie, for Allison and Arnie, for Simon. We pray for Dawn and Alida Schneider, for Mark and family, and for Fran. We pray for Dave and Joan, Lenora and family, Alex, Fran and Jean, Lori and Jens, Linda and John, Cecile and Ralph, 
Betty, Brett, and Austin. We pray for Daphne, for May and Ian and family, for Pat and family, for Mike and Madeline, for Lori, for Martha, Bob, and Sue, and for the Artisana Collective in Guatemala, for Andrea and Sandra and Lola and Myra, for Anna and Lisa, and Alex Thomas, who has now entered a hospice. We pray for all patients and staff at various rehabilitation centers, for Catherine and Arle and Ethan and Ed. We pray for Robin, who's recovering from a fall, for Jamie and for Jeff, for Andrew, for Anne and Julia and Brian, for Gina and Allison, and for Diane, who's halfway through her radiation treatment. God, we gather up all of these prayers for these people that are loved and known by us and, and the prayers that remain silently in our hearts and known only to you. And these we offer into your care. And now together let us sing the great prayer that Jesus our Christ left for us and for the church. song is often sung at the end of the celebration of ministry service every year that the region holds to ask people who are ordained or commissioned or recognized to then go out in the name of God and in on behalf of the church and do that. And
And I like to think that that's every one of our calls every time we leave this place is to go and tell God's precious people that they are loved and blessed. And if necessary, use words. But you don't have to. So go from this place and know that the blessing is not only upon you, but flows through you and is alive in the world. And may the peace of Christ attend us and the love of God surround us and the Holy Spirit keep us. Now and always.